I wanted to ask you only one question, very simple, that I'm sure you know by heart. Um, mm -hmm. Why is there this repetition, and how can how can the Kiriko justify his repetition of the same theme all over his career? Ah, um, yeah, this is an often uh, asked question. Um, uh, for Di Kiriko, uh, repeating his themes was, uh, in a certain sense, a way of uh, fixing his copyright on it. Like certain of his themes were uh, inventions that he carried through his life with the, the main ones are the piazza the italian piazza the metaphysical interior and the the troubadours the troubadours and um it, for him it was uh, it was a further way of understanding a certain theme and many are you know they're not copies they're elaborations on uh, on on a certain theme and uh he you know, it's it's a concept that then came up in uh, the 1960s with pop art, you know, with Warhol and the repetition of this very postmodern concept, which wasn't understood and, until, you know, postmodernism. Uh, Warhol, in fact, said of De Chirico that uh, he thought it was genius. He thought De Chirico was genius to uh, redo some paintings of his own and said, uh, the only difference between De Chirico and me is that what De Chirico redoes in a lifetime, I do it in a day. <laughs> yeah. No, but but, but uh, the fact that he takes a very early surrealist team and repeats them constantly because they are the most famous. Is there also is there also a kind of commercial issue? No, not at all. Number one, they are not surrealist. De Chirico was metaphysical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Surrealist is later. You're right. Sorry, sorry. Uh, their father, which he, you know, he collaborated for a, a short time with them, published uh, some of his writings in uh, La Révolution sur le and, uh, but, you know, so they really can't be uh, defined as surrealist. Um, no, there was not a, um, well, you know very well that how the surrealists uh, uh, condemned Di Chirico when he changed uh, style and went back to uh, painting uh, copies from the museum and doing research into technique. They thought, you know, after doing the most amazing, innovative um, creation in the in full avant-garde, uh, why would he go back to that? But De Chirico was always uh, his own man and did what he wanted. So, but what happened there is, you know, the, the commercial interest was on the side of the surrealists at the time because they had managed to recuperate and buy at a very low price many of his paintings that he had to leave in his Paris studio when he, had, when he got called to the war in, in 1915. And after you know, a certain time, he couldn't pay the rent. The landlord uh, wanted to empty the studio, and I think it was Giuseppe Ungaretti that was the go-between, and he sold these paintings to uh, Breton and Ward. So what did they do? They, uh, and De Chirico himself has written that. He said they, they did a, <clears throat> a coup that... Uh, they said, oh, uh, this, this painter painted these amazing paintings in his youth, and then he stopped, and only we have them. So there was a real financial interest by the Surios to market these works. And this, this uh, condemnation of De Chirico was, uh, was uh, tra um, transferred to the New York art scene in the mid-30s, uh, also through Dali. And this became the, uh, the, the sentence on De Chirico. So, you know, if he, rightly so, would go back and paint his piazzas or some in, uh, metaphysical interiors, it was purely his right to do so. And the thing is that these were never sold at uh, an early value, like what a, a 1916, 17 painting would be uh, sold for. They were sold at current market value. Yeah. And, but then you could say, oh, so why did he date them like this? Often, like sometimes he would date, uh, early date them. Uh, often it was the collectors that would come to his studio and say, you know, okay, do you have anything of this period? And he said, I've got metaphysical type paintings. And they would say, okay, but put this date on it or I'm not going to buy it. So at a certain point, you can understand the yeah. artist's anger. And he said, you know, if you're so interested about dates and not about the quality of the painting, why don't you become a stamp collector? <laughs> so he didn't uh, sell them? He, no, he, he would he would sell them, but sometimes he was obliged to put on an early an earlier date. But you can tell the difference. There's like no confusion there. Only 
very superficial eyes would not be able to tell the difference of what, you know, which was for his Paris or his Ferrara metaphysical paintings, and which were later 1930s or 40s. So, and do you uh, think, do you think that he had kind of attraction for kind of bad painting? Uh, no, this is another, uh, this is another one of those postmodern kind of uh, visions on De Chirico, which would make him roll over in his grave because he really <laughs> dedicated a lot to, to, you know, he wrote the Piccolo Trattato di Tecnica Pittorica. He dedicated a lot of work on, uh, on painting technique and great, great masters. So there's a lot about De Chirico that's really not understood. And it's yes, been that's why I'm story. asking. So the statement <laughs> is, I'm a real painter. And my right is to repaint what I like because I invented that. Yes, exactly. That's it. But uh, yes, and it, for him, it was redoing a theme was also a way of further understanding it. You know, even the idea of copying a painting from a great master was a way of understanding the process. He was very into the process of painting, which is the opposite of Warhol, which was just you know it's a repetition, but it's like a mechanical repetition. Yeah, machine was in the process of the production of the 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 artist of the painting and um and he he would he enjoyed painting no end like he would paint from morning to night <laughs> and so there's nothing uh, cynical about Kiriko? i would say not they, they also the 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 uh, surrealists and this whole <coughs> excuse me yes. sort of thing this sort of fame built around him there's not much truth to it. He was actually a very, a very homebody, uh, calm person. He had a fabulous sense of humor, irony. He was not um, flamboyant or arrogant in, in any way. Although he would say what he was worth in in uh, in interviews, and he would state his opinions very strongly in in, in journals and and. Uh, you know, public statements, of course he would, but um, I, I, I think he was uh, quite a pure, actually quite a pure soul. So, no, no, not cynical? Not cynical, no. He was probably pretty mad at, at how his work had been treated, you know, because really there was put this uh, uh, sort of block that, ha that, you know, he was only, what, in, uh, he was 30 when he stopped paying, well, when he finished his metaphysical, first metaphysical period, and wow, he still produced work for another uh, 60 years. And you have the world saying, oh, no, only that, only that. Like, like if, you know, <laughs> open your eyes and see what he did in the inventiveness of what he did in the 1920s, you know, with the archaeologists, the, the furniture in the valley, the gladiators, the horses by the seashore. They are so poetic and profound on a, on really on a human uh on a human sort of aspect of what it is for the, the being to be in the world with all this history and all the, what the, you know, the soul carries with it through life. He's an extremely profound painter, greatly, a huge culture also, very, very wide culture. <laughs>